In Thailand, they have a custom of printing books at funerals and handing them out to all the people who come. Most often, they're books about Dhamma, sometimes about other things. And if there's been time between the death of the person and the cremation, they'll include a little biography. How the person was born, educated, got married or didn't get married, what work the person did. And they'll talk about how, as life went on, they began to notice a disease here and a disease there. And at first it was manageable, and they got heavier and heavier. And they finally got to the point where the doctors, even the best doctors, couldn't help. And the person died. And you always wonder what the person thought at that point, when the, even the best doctor said, well, sorry, we can't help you now. What they were able to do. If they had a practice, they could focus on that. If they didn't, their minds would be all over the place. So it's good to think about that. There'd be a time when people with the best will in the world and the most capable people can't help you. But the body reaches the point where it's too sick, too decrepit, whatever. And it's just you facing the fact that you're going to die. So what did you do then? Well, you work on the good qualities in the mind. And what work you've done leading up to that point in working on the good qualities of the mind, you'd be glad you did it. So it's good to keep that perspective in mind every day, every day, as you sit down to meditate. There will come a point where you're going to be passing away, and all you have is your meditation. It helps give you a perspective on what you're doing, you know, the worth of what you're doing. Because all too often the world will say other things. Other things are more important. Your study is more important. Your work is more important. Your family is more important. And of course the media will scream at you with all kinds of things. Pay attention to this, pay attention to that. You wouldn't believe what so-and-so did, what so-and-so said. That kind of stuff won't give you any help. It's your ability to keep the mind focused and have a strong sense that there is an awareness that's not dependent on the body. And you want to find it inside, because that's something that you can take as your refuge. We talk about taking the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha as our refuge. And refuge occurs on many levels. There's the external level, of course. The, the Buddha is a good example of how to practice. He was determined that there must be something deathless, and he was going to find it, or he was going to die in the process. He was that dedicated. Think about that. We tend to think of Buddhism as being a, opposed to desire, but he had a very strong desire and a very strong dedication. There must be a happiness that is not going to let you down. And so he searched for it, and he put himself on the line, tested himself again and again as he tested different teachings, different paths of practice. And it's through being very truthful with himself and being very observant, or as he later said, being committed and then learning how to reflect, that he finally found that way. So we have his example. We have the example of the Dharma that he taught and how to train the mind in generosity, in virtue, meditation. And then there's the Sangha, the other people who've practiced in line with what the Buddha taught and found that, yes, it's true, that you can achieve the deathless through this path. Those, as, as I said, are their external refuge. They need to try to internalize that refuge by developing the qualities that they had. In terms of the Buddha, he's said to have three qualities, wisdom, compassion, purity. And you try to develop those within you. 
in terms of the Dhamma. Buddha said when you take the Dhamma as your refuge, you're taking yourself as your refuge. In other words, you internalize the teachings. In particular, you develop mindfulness. You establish mindfulness right here at the body. Stay with the breath coming in, breath going out. Because that's your anchor in the present moment. As long as you're with the breath, you know you're in the present moment. If you lose the breath, well, you can wander off to the past, wander off to the future. But there is no future breath you could watch, no past breath you can watch. So when you're with the breath, you know you're here. Because you want to observe the mind right here. Because it's the movements of the mind that make the difference between creating suffering and putting an end to suffering. So you stay with the breath. Try to keep it comfortable. Breathe in, breathe out in a way that feels good all the way through the body. Because there will be those tendencies for to run out after the world again. You need something to counterbalance those, those forces that point outside, outside, outside all the time. You want something that points inside. Because if you want to get some control over the mind, you have to learn how to understand it. Because that's the biggest fear, is that, as the Buddha said, when you pass away from this body, go on looking for another one. It's going to be through the power of craving. And sometimes our cravings are desperate, and sometimes our cravings are random. Something pops into the mind. As the Buddha said, there's nothing quicker to change than the mind. You seem to be going in one direction, all of a sudden you're going someplace else. Now you want to learn how to take advantage of that, of that quality. In other words, if you see the mind is going in a bad direction, remind yourself you're not committed to a bad direction. You can always think of something skillful. But you have to watch out for the other tendency to leave something skillful and go back for something that's not. So you want to understand why those changes of direction come, you've got to stay right here and watch the mind as you try to keep it with one object, keep it with the breath. Because it will wander off. You have to keep reminding yourself, no, that's not where I want to be right now. I want to be right here. And we have those reflections before the meditation. And the world is swept away, it does not endure, offers no shelter, there's no one in charge. Just to remind you, if you go out looking in the world, you're not going to find the satisfaction you need, and you're not going to develop the skills you're going to need when the world can no longer help you. And you can reflect further. What does the world have to offer? Well, it has material gain and material loss, status, loss of status. Praise and criticism, sensual pleasure and pain. That's pretty much it. And how are those things going to help you? And you get caught up in the, the merry-go-round that goes up and then it goes down, and then up again and down again. Then you realize the best place to be would be outside of all that. So you keep directing the mind in, directing the mind in. And as you do this, you're also internalizing the qualities of the Sangha. The Sangha practices well, practices straightforwardly, practices masterfully. You really want to master this as a skill, because this is the one skill that will hold you in good stead when, as I said, even the best doctors can't help you anymore. So the meditation is a combination of technique and values. And the main value, of course, is heedfulness, realizing that you need to develop these skills for your own safety, for your own well-being. We have that chant, may you forever be well. It 
And after we've been chatting about the world is swept away and we're subject to aging, illness, and death, it sounds kind of like a wan hope. But actually it's a real hope. As the Buddha said, there is a deathless happiness, something that's not subject to change. Permanence is one of the epithets he gives to it. Refuge, harbor, safety. freedom. These are all good things, and they can be found in here. They're not going to be found out there. You may have heard of that Zen koan where the student asks if dogs have Buddha nature, and the master says no, which is opposed to all, all the Mahayana teachings. I think what the Master is getting at is here, looking outside for enlightenment, looking outside for guarantees of enlightenment, you're not going to find it. You have to look inside. That's where the, the awakening is going to be found. So keep turning your gaze inward. This doesn't mean that you're not aware of the world. But there are times when you have to put the world aside. This doesn't mean that you neglect your duties, you take them on, but you learn how to wear them in such a way that you can put them down. You're not carrying them around all the time. In the old days, and I noticed in Thailand, you go down near the docks, they used to have all these coolies who would carry huge loads on their backs bent over as they walked up, bent over as they came back down again. Even when they weren't carrying the load, they were bent over. They had been carrying so many loads for such a long time that that became their posture. And all too often our minds are like that. We are carrying loads day after day after day. And even when you take the load off, you're bent over. When you meditate, you're learning how to stand up straight. You're learning how to maintain your balance. You're learning how to stay centered so that the world doesn't knock you over, so aging, illness, and death don't knock you over. So this is important work that we're doing. Always have a strong sense of its importance. It's worthy of your full attention. and it will reward your full attention.